So this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> um, so Terry is here to uh, kind of help me out by hopefully keeping people on mute as much as possible. Um, okay. Yeah, because we're getting some background noise. Okay. Um, and to answer questions, so if you have questions, just put them in the chat and she will either help you out or we can get them uh, at the end of the presentation. So we're talking about section A of the elevation certificate this morning. And so the elevation certificate is, you know, a technical document that we use to verify compliance and a couple of other things. So it has to be signed and sealed by a licensed surveyor or an engineer. Um, architects are not allowed to sign them in Kansas. And so that's a state rule. Um, they can in other places. So you, if you read the instructions, it will say that, but um, you should be aware of that rule uh, in Kansas. And so we also use them to show that sites are on natural grade above um, the base flood elevation. And so some people are kind of unaware of the LOMA application process and that the elevation certificate itself does not legally take you out of the floodplain. So that is a separate process and um, you know whatever you can do to help people be aware of that, that they have to go through that process to actually come out of the floodplain. They can't just you know use the elevation certificate, but it can be used to support a LOMA application, but that's what actually takes them out. And so again, we use them to ensure that properties are elevated properly, and that is probably the most important use of it um, now that they are optional for flood insurance. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they used to be required for flood insurance, and now um, under the new rating process, they have a first floor height tool that is used to calculate that and a lot of other factors that come up with the premium. And so they're just not required to have an elevation certificate anymore uh, to try to relieve the burden of paying to get the survey done and everything. And so you can find it at fema.gov. Um, so you should be checking daily at this point because it actually expires tomorrow. And so I'll be talking more about that, but um, that's where you should go to find it and make sure you have the current form. Um, and as far as insurance, if the first floor height does, tool doesn't work, they have um, a process for making assumptions about what that height is based on the foundation type that they have. And so there is really this split between um, floodplain management and insurance at this point. So it's you know good to be aware of that. Um, and so having this document uh, is important on file for any new development. And then making sure that people understand what you mean when you explain things. So there have been cases where we've had things built out of compliance just because people misunderstood a term like top of the bottom floor. So we had someone build a structure that had a basement because they thought the top of the bottom floor would be the basement ceiling and so then they ended up having to fill it in and you know it's extra expenses and things like that so it's important to explain what we mean um, by these different terms and because they are uh, terms that you might not see or come across elsewhere and it's often that citizens are not looking up what they mean so um, doing what you can to maybe explain things a couple of different ways might help you avoid um, unintentional violations. And so the lowest floor means the lowest floor of the lowest enclosed area, which could be an unfinished floor. It could be the floor of a crawl space. Um, yeah, it just depends on the foundation type, but understanding that the lowest floor uh, is again, the lowest enclosed area, including a basement, if there was a basement for say a pre-firm structure, because new structures in the floodplain should not have basements. And so uh, making sure people understand that. Um, and then first floor height is something that's new. Uh, it's used for insurance and it's the height of the building's first lowest floor that's above the adjacent grade. So that would be probably the floor above a basement if it had a basement. Um, and just because the lowest floor might be um, below grade or below 
the base flood elevation doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be rated based on that. Um, but the foundation is going to impact the insurance rate. So again, there's a little bit of disconnect between floodplain management and insurance at this point. Um, so just having an understanding of that will help you out. Um, and then what is a basement? Making sure that people understand a basement is any a floor that's below grade on all four sides. And so, um, again, that's not allowed in the floodplain unless you're part of the exemption program. And we only have a couple of communities that are a part of that. And um, many of them are not even permitting basements anymore. They have to be built in a very specific way. So um, even if you have a Lomar F, you can't put in a basement. And so if you have an application for that, you do have to sign off on the fact that it's not going to have a basement. And we do have classes on Lomar F, so if there are any questions about that. Um, we've had just a couple cases of surveyors putting in false information um, intentionally because they thought they were kind of helping out their client by doing that, but obviously that doesn't help you. Um, and so I don't, you know, we don't, we haven't had very many problems with that. It's just been a few people. So um, it's something to look out for and making sure that you're really reviewing any elevation certificates that you receive to make sure that that's not the case. Um, and as I said, the expiration date is actually tomorrow. So from that point, we need to be checking FEMA.gov daily to make sure that we're still in the grace period with this form. So basically, um, they have, uh, you know, targeted trying to get it out by the end of this month, by the expiration date, but that's usually not the case. Um, so there's usually a grace period of at least several months or weeks or something before they release the new form. And so we need to make sure that we're using the current form. So as soon as the new form comes out, that's what we need to be using. Otherwise, it won't be valid. And so, yeah, FUMA doesn't have a great track record with releasing things exactly on time. So it might be a while before this new form comes out. And I wanted to say um, for you guys and anyone watching this in the future, uh, it is a little bit awkward timing that I'm talking about the current form when there might be a new form released, but most of what I'm saying is going to remain uh, valid and um, relevant from what I understand, and I can't talk too much about the updates until it's released, but most of it's gonna be clarification on things to um, try to make it clear and help people avoid any mistakes. So, um, you know, it's gonna be a different form, but again, most of what I'm saying is not gonna change on that. And so uh, just keep an eye out for the new form. And I do plan on sending out a follow-up email as soon as that's released to everyone here who's participating. Um, because it, again, it is like a little bit of weird timing with the changes. So I wanted to make sure that I follow up with the new form and let you know of any uh, significant changes on that. So just uh, something to watch out for. And so again, section A at the top, you can see there's a line that says to copy uh, this form for the community official. So that would be the floodplain uh, administrator and for insurance, if they're gonna use it for insurance in the building owner. So you should always be getting a copy of these. Sometimes you don't get a copy um, because people might just kind of forget about it or overlooked. Um, we've had surveyors say that it's the property owner's personal information, which isn't true. Um, it's basically public information. And then if you're looking for an elevation certificate, uh, it's usually with the uh, recorder deeds office with the county. So that's where I would go and look for an elevation certificate if you can't find it and you don't have it on file. Um, people sometimes ask us if we keep copies of them, we don't. Um, that's really part of the community uh, record keeping. So um, that's where it should be kept. And again, you should have um, a copy on file that goes with the permit. And so um, if someone won't give you a copy of it, which I don't think we've had too many problems with that, but basically they signed and sealed with their license um, 
you know, in section D. And so they've basically agreed to give you a copy because of this line at the top. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, and just make sure you always get a copy. Um, so we do suggest that you just try to keep an eye on your floodplain, maybe do like a windshield survey and just kind of keep an eye out for new development because it happens frequently that people don't know they need a permit or whatever the case may be. So it's just something to watch out for. So lines A1 through 4 are pretty self-explanatory. It's just the building owner's name, property address, um, that type of thing, the legal description. Um, and then making sure that you have all six pages of the form. Uh, I think it's like eight pages all together with the instructions and everything. And that might change with the new form. It might be longer. I'm not really sure. but. Um, just making sure you have a full and complete form and that all the parts are there. Um, and so you can see section A is basically um, like half of the page. Um, and so we have had issues with this part of the form. Um, we've had surveyors put in their own name or the developer's name or someone else's name. Um, and this may change because obviously building ownership can change over the lifetime of a structure, um, but the property address and the name should match up, um, at least when it's signed and certified and everything. So you wanna check that, make sure it matches up. And then A4 building use is important because we have different standards um, depending on what we have adopted for residential, non-residential and accessory structures. So making sure that that is correct. Um, will help us verify whether it's actually in compliance or not. And so the elevation certificate doesn't distinguish between different types of non-residential structures. Obviously, there are different types, but that's not reflected, at least on this version of the form. So that's something to watch out for. And then A5, um, the latitude and the longitude, needs to be filled out to at least five decimal places. And again, that might change. Um, so the example they give on the instructions has only four places, even though they say five. So just want to make sure that if there are at least five decimal places at this point, especially if it's for a LOMA, uh, it might um, you know, be kicked back as a mistake if not. Um, and then making sure that the horizontal datum is also checked. Uh, you might want to watch out for that. That's something that we see a lot is people just kind of leaving that blank. So uh, that needs to be checked. And then basically, and I'll, I'll be talking you know, about the rest of the elevation certificate over the next couple of days, but making sure that the datums match up is also an important aspect of this. Um, Cause if you had different datums, it could be a couple of feet off and we don't want you know, that to happen uh, just because of a mistake. So checking the datum and then uh, line A6 just says to attach two photographs. So it's just a sentence here that says, attach the photographs to the certificate. So this is that page. Um, so we need a minimum of two photos. Um, they should be in color, three inches by three inches with the timestamp on there. So they need to be labeled with the timestamp. Um, so I'm thinking this probably has changed. It used to be that you had to have the photos taken within the last 90 days for an insurance policy. But now that elevation certificates are not required anymore, that may have changed, but um, they have to show the foundation and the openings. So the the two minimum photos are the front and back that are required of the structure. Um, and this can help us clear up any unusual situations. So we have had uh, situations where there's like a mixed foundation where part of the structure has a crawl space and the other part is like slab on grade. And so having photos like this can help us clear up any anomalies on the form. And this helps us confirm the building diagram because that is the most common mistake that we see is an incorrect building diagram for A7. And so we wanna make sure that that is cleared up 
and that we have a very clear understanding of what type of structure we have. And especially for split levels, we want to see the side view so that that much is clear. Um, and so just go ahead and take extra pictures or ask them to take extra pictures. Obviously, we're in the digital age. Um, digital photos are free. We've got plenty of pixels. And so they can just go ahead and download more of this page, like additional uh, photo pages so that they can um, include those extra photos as an attachment. And so it helps us make a record of what was there uh, when you approved the permit, because, you know, um, we have had modifications done to structures that made them non-compliant. And so this can help you verify um, that you permitted a compliant structure and the surveyor signed off on a compliant structure at the time. So um, it does help you make a record of what was there when you saw it and approved it and everything. So, um, all right. So yeah, line A7 is for the building diagram. And so that's where that number will appear. Um, Again, that's the most common mistake that we see. And so we want to compare the building diagram number to the other sections of the certificate to make sure that they, that information matches up. Because again, we can have unusual situations that don't exactly fit the diagrams. And so we want to make it as clear as possible, hopefully. And again, I'll talk about the other sections uh, that would also be a part of this over the next couple of days, but especially the comment section in section D is another important aspect of making sure uh, that it's very clear what the um, certificate is for. So um, again, we've had mixed foundation types where part of it was raised slab on grade that was like an office building and then um, another part of it had a crawl space. And so there's there was information for having you know, flood openings and that kind of thing, but it also had uh, the raised slab on grade diagram number. So making sure that that's clear. Um, so again, the photos and the comments section are an important part of that to avoid confusion and help to explain and document everything thoroughly. So you wanna watch out for those red flags. Um, because like in the example I just talked about, it doesn't make sense to have a raised slab on grade um, diagram number and then have information for openings. And that kind of thing could impact someone's insurance, I think, if they were using it uh, for that purpose. And so if they were entering the information into the risk grading um, application, um, you know, it could it could cause confusion or cause someone to have a higher premium. So we want to make sure that we have the correct information in there um, and thinking about the first floor height um, for insurance purposes. And so that's why you know, it's important to go over the diagrams and what you're looking for for each one to verify you know, compliance for you know, these different types of structures. So diagram 1A, is slab on grade, it could have more than one story and it might have an attached garage. So you can see in this photo, it does have an attached garage. Um, so C2A, and again, we'll go over section C um, on Thursday. Yep. Um, so it's not really part of section A, but it is important to understand the diagrams because again, the diagram number is part of section A. So C2A is the top of the bottom floor. So that would just be the top of the slab. Um, C2B would be if there was any other stories above that. And then uh, C2F through H is determined by uh, that particular site um, and the grade there. So <laughs> this one's pretty straightforward. Um, this is the back of that same structure. Again, C2A is the top of the slab. Um, and then they have a metal frame for their utilities. So you can see it's a little bit elevated off the ground, which is what you want to see. Um, FEMA did start requiring that um, utilities be elevated. And so it's not on the slab, it's above the grade, it's on a stand. Um, 
Unfortunately, they would not get the machinery and equipment credit. Um, I think I'll cover that in some of the later classes, but um, for a slab on grade, it would have to be up to the attic level for them to get that 5% discount on their insurance. Um, again, things are a little bit disconnected between floodplain management and insurance at this point, um, but it's kind of uh, useful to know at least a couple of these things to help people if they are interested in getting insurance or if they have to get insurance, um, how they can save on their premium a little bit and get that discount. But it is obviously better for them to have it elevated even a little bit uh, to give them that extra layer of protection. They also went in and made this slab a little bit thicker uh, to help them elevate this. And this one is actually not in the floodplain. They have floodplain in their front yard, but it's still a good example. Um, just that they have that extra margin of safety because again, they are right next to the floodplain. And so we often see this type of construction for commercial buildings. Um, if you think about most of the restaurants and retail stores you've been in, um, they're probably slab on grade. And so this one is under construction. This is a, well, it's gonna be a drive-through like fast food restaurant. And so, um, yeah, most restaurants and industrial buildings are slab on grade. Um, so they're still putting in a parking lot in this picture. And so obviously this should not have a finished elevation certificate at this point. It could be an under construction certificate, which some communities do uh, require developers to provide them because it kind of helps you to verify compliance before the structure is finished because it's easier to fix any mistakes um, before that point in time. So that's something to consider that you might want uh, new structures to have an under construction or even a certificate for the construction drawings. And that way you can help people avoid mistakes before uh, they make them or finish the structure. So diagram 1B, is raised slab on grade. So it's very much the same as the 1A, but usually this is stem walls that have fill in the middle. So they put dirt inside of that and then they pour slab over top of it. Um, it's cheaper for them to use fill than it is to just make it all cement. So this is common for warehouses and loading docks. Um, so, it's common for them to do this because the um, the door, like the loading bay doors are often even with the truck. So this is common for them. Um, so C2A would just be the top of that slab. Again, C2B would be any next higher floors and the rest of it kind of depends on the actual site. Um, so it's not really common for residential structures to have this. It's mostly non-residential, but we have seen a few residential structures that are uh, 1B. So 2A, this is a structure with a basement. Again, that means it's below grade on all four sides. Um, and again, some of these terms can be confusing for people. Um, walkout basements, um, there's a couple different examples of that and they're different diagrams. And so I will talk about that, but it's Again, important to explain what you mean by like walkout basement, uh, daylight basement. There's all these different terms that people can interpret in different ways. So just being aware of that. Again, basements are not compliant in the floodplain. They should not be built in the floodplain as new developments. So these should be pre-firmed structures that we're talking about in this case or um, you know, before they were mapped in. So uh, below grade on all four sides. This is a common issue that we see, especially in Kansas, because there's been kind of more concern about tornadoes and flooding. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a common issue. And so the window well is the lowest adjacent grade. Um, and so being aware of that, um, surveyors sometimes don't wanna use that number because it, it changes the cost of insurance. Um, Obviously, it would be a violation if it was a new structure. And so, um, again, we haven't had too much problem with dishonesty in surveyors, but um, um, yeah, 
it can happen. So just be aware of that and make sure that the lowest adjacent grade is the bottom of the window well. Um, it can impact the loma, but we've had these be approved before because of the intervening high ground um, around the window well. So it can still be taken out of the floodplain if it's on natural grade that's above the base flood elevation. And so um, again, we wanna make sure that these are accurate and compliant. Um, mistakes don't actually help people. Um, so we wanna to go to the comment section, make sure there's always comments. There should always be comments on every elevation certificate and then describe the window well and the elevation of the intervening higher grade for a loma. So um, it would have to be on natural grade and not fill. Uh, if the fill was placed before it was put or before it was mapped into the floodplain, it can be considered natural grade. Um, again, we have plenty of uh, letter of map change classes. So if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to help or uh, direct you to those other recordings. But basically, you have intervening higher ground around the outside of the window well, and so it can still you know, be considered outside of the floodplain, even though, <clears throat> sorry, even though the lowest adjacent grade is at the bottom of the window well. Um, so here's a couple examples of window wells, um, aluminum or cement. It doesn't really matter what it's made of, even though this one has a uh, plexiglass over the top of it, it's still considered to be the lowest adjacent grade at the bottom of the window well. So just making sure that that is accurate. Um, and then at the top, we have a couple examples of the raised slab on grade. Um, yeah, portion. Um, so here's a drawing of that. So the lowest adjacent grade is still at the bottom of that. Uh, loading bay door is at the, the bottom of the foundation. That's where the lowest adjacent grade would go. And, um, you know, we haven't had many people have success trying to apply for a LOMA because there's usually cement. And so um, I was told by a surveyor that, that, that trying to get a LOMA based on the intervening higher grade for a place that's surrounded by cement has not been successful. But here is a, oops, sorry, a drawing of basically a structure or house that has a basement and talking about the window well and how that's the lowest adjacent grade. So they've kind of just given them a sketch and this went with the LOMA application and it helped the reviewers to understand that there was intervening, intervening higher grade and so this LOMA was actually approved because they had that, that factor. And so that's something that can help them uh, determine what the actual situation is. And so, um, you know, it's not a bad idea to include a sketch like that. And so basically the intervening higher ground will prevent the flood water from touching the structure, which again is how they got their LOMA approved. So <clears throat> diagram 2B is also a basement, but it's called like a walkout basement or a sunken patio. And so really reading through the elevation certificate instructions can help you to understand things a lot better. And from what I understand, again, about the new form is that there's going to be a lot of clarification on things and expansions on instructions and that kind of thing. So definitely read through the instructions on the elevation certificate, it can help you understand things better. So um, it's the same as the um, the regular basement, um, sorry, but you have this area that is at the same level as the basement floor, but it's like an outdoor area that you can walk out. There's a retaining wall and then stairs going up to the rest of the uh, regular grade. So again, this is still a basement. Um, it's still not compliant uh, to build a basement like this, um, but it is common to see it. And so we call it a walkout patio or a sunken patio. Again, trying to explain these different terms because people have different understandings of what they mean. And so it's all below grade and it is a 
a true basement, which again, below grade on all four sides. So um, understanding this, understanding that people cannot build them even with a Wilmar F, that's not compliant, um, which we come across a lot. And so again, basements are not a good idea in the floodplain. Um, you know, the deeper the grade is, um, so the deeper you go as um, floodwaters um, infiltrate the soil, uh, the pressure increases linearly with that depth and then you have buoyancy on the bottom. And so it's common for walls to collapse because of the empty space inside of the basement as the water is pushing in. Again, the pressure is increasing with that depth and the floor can buckle, um, cracks, water's coming through. Um, and we see it commonly with basements in the floodplain. Um, it can cause, you know, major structural damage. And so in this example, the basement window is also broken. And so you have water coming in this way, which is why it's not uh, allowed in the floodplain again, unless you're part of the exemption program and there are very strict rules about how those are, are constructed. So <clears throat> and we've seen this with in-ground swimming pools as well. They can float up out of the water. Um, so it's a common problem with flooding and floodplains, as well as like um, fuel tanks at the gas station, we've seen them uh, float through and break the parking lot surface. So the same concept, that's why we don't allow basements. Um, and then building diagram three, this is a split level and it's a slab on grade. So you can see uh, the slab there, the bottom floor, and then the next higher floor is in between. Um, so the garage is not a living floor. It's um, you know used for just parking, storage, and building access. And so when you walk in the front door, um, there's a next higher floor, um, which is C2B, is the next higher floor that's over the garage. And so again, there's no mitigation credit here if the um, utilities are in the garage floor. Um, which again is a 5% discount if they qualify for it. But basically your utilities have to be at a certain level for the type of structure that you have. So <clears throat> again, for this one, the, the uh, bottom floor is at or above grade. There's no basement on this. Um, so it needs to be at grade at least on one side. Um, so usually you walk in the front door, there's a living space there, and then you have a landing for stairs that go to the top and down to the garage level. And then diagram four is similar. It's a split level structure that is not slab on grade. It has a basement. And so um, again, you walk in the front door and you have a landing. So in this case, there's not really a floor there. It's a landing for stairs that go up a floor and then down a floor. And so they call the windows a view out window, I think. Um, and basically they're waist high windows um, down in the basement. And then you have a C2B would be the next floor above that. And then, um, so yeah, again, not compliant. It's below grade on all four sides uh, as far as the basement floor. Um, yeah. Okay, so diagram five is elevated on piers, posts, or columns. And then you can see there's an open foundation uh, underneath that floor. So you can see all the way through to the other side. Um, so we do have these in Kansas. Um, they're not as high, they're elevated as high as you would see on the coast, um, but they are, they are there. So this is um, an open foundation, piers, posts, or columns, or piles. Um, and then sometimes the structure is just resting on those piers, posts, piles, or columns. Uh, they might not be attached. So we have seen cases um, in Texas specifically where the structure was just resting on it. And so it floated away as you know, the flood water's rising. So making sure that it's properly attached to that I-beam is an important part of this type of structure. Um, and then here's a, another example of it. It's a larger structure, but it is 
um, a diagram five in Kansas. So again, you can see the open foundation underneath and all the way through to the other side. And then similarly, this one is a manufactured home that is actually properly attached to these concrete piles. Um, and this is, I think, the highest example that we have in Kansas, as far as we know, um, that we've seen. It's like elevated about five feet. It's again, properly attached and elevated. Um, they're just finishing the staircase on that one. And then skirting is something that we see. So manufactured homes sometimes have these uh, aluminum siding that's kind of around the foundation and it's collapsible. It's not a rigid wall. And so we have had um, some mistakes on elevation certificates where this was mistaken for a crawl space or an enclosure um, when it's really not. So for it to be actually an enclosure, it would have to be um, like rigid walls, like a wooden frame or something like that. This is just sort of a collapsible uh, aluminum siding. So <laughs> being aware of that and that it's not actually part of the foundation is something to watch out for. Uh, and then diagram six. So this is an elevated structure with an enclosure before below the elevated floor. Um, I think we, yeah, we don't have very many examples of this in Kansas, but you know, it is something that you might see. So, and the living floor is elevated and then the enclosure below that is used just for parking, storage or building access. Um, so it's kind of a small room under the house, um, which again, should not be used as a living space. Um, it's limited in its use. So making sure that you're aware of that and what that space can be used for and maybe enforcing a non-conversion agreement might help you to ensure compliance and make sure there's no uh, modification later on that would make it non-compliant. And that would go for any enclosure that you're dealing with on a residential structure or um, like an attached garage also should not be converted to a living space. <clears throat> so here's another example of that. This is a diagram six that's near Salina. Um, and so you can see the enclosure there and then that it's elevated on posts, uh, piles or piers on the other side. And so um, you can't see the openings on this one, but uh, they should be there you know, as part of the enclosure. And then this one is kind of on the, uh, directly adjacent to a stream. And so uh, the ground kind of like falls away on the other side and that's why it's elevated as high as it is. And then diagram seven. So again, I've talked about walkout basements and that kind of thing. Um, so if it's below grade, even on three sides and then at grade at the other side, that would be a diagram seven like this. And so um, again, the real basement and the FEMA defined basement is below grade on all sides. And so this is a little bit different than that. And just, um, you know, making sure you're clear on these terms and what you're looking for. So diagram seven is elevated on a full story enclosure. So it's all foundation walls. Um, and then obviously it should have openings, the flood openings. So you can see that here. Um, and then that can't be used as living space either. So this again should be parking storage or building access. And you can actually see the water line on this photo where it was inundated for two months, I think. Um, but because they used it compliantly, it wasn't used as living space. They were able to just do minimal cleaning and there was no damage to it. So, um, you know, the elevated part is a living space and then the bottom is use, just used as a garage. Uh, so here's another example that's very close by to that other building. Uh, again, you can see the high water line on it. Uh, it was inundated in the same flood. And then you can see the utilities on this one elevated. And this one actually would qualify for the machinery and the equipment discount on a flood insurance policy. Um, which I think I will cover in um, one of the other classes. So here is 
Um, a unique situation, it's a manufactured home. It is in Kansas. It was flooded in the early 90s. And it looks like a diagram seven, but it's actually just like stud walls and then chicken wire with stucco covering it. So it looks like cement foundation walls, but it's actually not. Um, so it's not a diagram seven. This one is actually just in violation of you know, how it should be built. Um, and then they built a metal stand, but then they left the utilities on the ground next to it. So definitely not in compliance for multiple reasons. It could have other types of violations with the um, city code. So um, watching out for things like this. And <clears throat> if an enclosure is over five feet, it's considered a story. So um, if you go over five feet, it should be considered a another story. Uh, and so we have had issues like this uh, where a crawl space is too large to be considered a crawl space. And so just um, being aware of stuff like that. Um, building diagram eight is elevated on a crawl space, which is at or above grade on at least one side. So again, the home basement definition um, being aware of that, but this is pretty common. So you have C2A is the bottom of the crawl space floor. Um, and then you have C2B, which would be the next higher floor, which is usually just the living floor. Um, sometimes the crawl space isn't accessible. So you might actually have to go into the structure and hopefully uh, everyone is doing inspections as things are being constructed. It is part of um, doing floodplain management and um, it should be written into your permit and your ordinance uh, that you would be doing inspections on things. And so um, there should be flood openings, obviously, and that would be a eight on the certificate. And so making sure that you have at least um, one square inch per every Enclo square foot of enclosed space is the rule um, on at least two sides and no higher than one foot above grade. And so um, this particular structure, it's elevated on a crawl space. It's a repetitive loss property. And so they did make an ICC or increased cost of compliance claim on this. So they elevated the utilities, but then um, they had no flood openings. So you can see there's not really any flood openings in this picture. Um, it kind of looks like one near the front door, near the staircase, but it's actually a, a dryer vent, which is not the same thing as a flood opening. And so again, making sure things have openings. Um, we recently had a violation like this that we were looking at the elevation certificate and there's not enough openings on it. So just being aware of that and making sure that the enclosed space and the net opening match up and making sure that that is compliant. So again, the lowest floor is the lowest floor. It doesn't matter if it's an unfinished dirt floor. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be rated that way on a policy. So, making sure that that matches up as well for the lowest floor. And so in this case, the property owner uh, covered up the flood vents um, with wood, which can cause serious problems. Um, we have flood openings to equalize the pressure from flood waters. And so if you don't have that, it can collapse the foundation walls. And so people don't like have flood openings for different reasons because they think they'll have um, pests come into their house or it makes the floor cold or whatever the reason it's common for people to cover them up and so um, hopefully after you've permitted development you go by and do like a periodic um, like look at everything um, do a periodic inspection to make sure that things have remained compliant and so when this elevation certificate was certified, it was, you know, the flood openings were there and they were documented with the photos and everything. And so, again, that serves as your protection to make sure that you permitted something that was compliant. And, um, you know, there's nothing you can do if people go out later 
and uh, cover them up, but you need to, again, do periodic inspections uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen. Because again, it's common for people to want to cover them up. Um, you can also suggest engineered openings that can be used. So they automatically open and close with floodwaters and that way it will help um, solve whatever issues people have with having openings in their foundation. So um, regular openings can have covers or louves um, or grates, that's also common. We just need to make sure that, again, the net opening is equal to the enclosed space. And so we have to account for covers uh, taking up some of that opening. Um, and so we'll take a closer look at um, openings in a minute, but yeah, basically this one was uh, covered up and then they had a violation, worked with the floodplain administrator to uncover them and then they did it again. Um, so they're kind of on a watch list. So that can happen. Uh, again, you wanna kind of keep an eye on your floodplain and look for things like this. <clears throat> and then I just wanted to take a minute to talk about uh, flood insurance. Again, there's a bit of a disconnect, but um, of course we have the statewide one foot of freeboard uh, law. So everything has to have one foot of freeboard. Um, so it used to be uh, the lowest floor and the base flood elevation would determine the premium and that was it. Um, and that's not the case anymore. So everybody is under risk rating 2.0 at this point. Um, and so those, those things are still part of the premium calculation. They're still variables, but there are a lot more variables at this point. Um, so they were basically just trying to make sure that everything is at its actuarial rates and including these other factors. So catastrophe modeling, um, other um, federal sources like uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers and um, other agencies, as well as the replacement cost. Um, that's something else that's new uh, to make sure that people are you know, paying a premium that uh, takes into account the actual replacement costs and the, the value of their structure and previous claims and that kind of thing. So um, basically if people need information about flood insurance, they have to go to a an insurance agent at this point. We used to be able to help them out a little bit more with the um, calculation tables, but those are no longer valid. So if people do have questions about insurance, they have to work with an agent to get those answers. But again, the mitigation discount is based on the lowest adjacent grade, first floor height, and then I have mentioned the machinery and equipment uh, discount that can also be given if your utilities are high enough based on your structure type. So we can't give them a precise number, but as always, the higher you build, the lower your premium will be, and there's no substitution for elevation, even though um, it can be expensive, it might pay off in the long run. Uh, by not getting flooded and for uh, having a lower premium. So um, this is also uh, from the flood insurance manual that came out last year. Uh, and this is talking about the different diagram numbers and um, how uh, the lowest floor elevation is interpreted by that and how they can use the um, elevation certificate for that. So, uh, this is how to rate them, again, from the flood insurance manual. Um, yep. So it's not too important, but if you have questions about the flood, in, like flood insurance, you should look at the flood insurance manual. It's very expansive and uh, comprehensive. So uh, take a look at that. And back to the structure, uh, the vents, again, were unblocked and then reblocked. So it's kind of a, an ongoing violation with them. So again, periodic inspections can help you avoid situations like that. Um, and then enclosures below the lowest floor. So we've looked at the different diagrams, like the uh, diagram eight crawl space building. So the flood openings, again, at least on different sides, they don't have to be opposite sides. For some reason, um, people have had that misconception that they have to be on opposite sides. Uh, just at least two different sides, no more than one foot above grade. And again, um, one square 
inch of net opening per every square foot of enclosed space. And then it is important also to make sure that the interior uh, ground level is at or above uh, the outside grade because you can easily create a basement situation by putting fill around the outside. And that's also something that we've seen commonly is people unintentionally making basements by trying to do that. And so um, if you come out of the floodplain, that could work. Um, but it's also something to be aware of that the interior should be at the same level. And again, the point of the flood openings is to make sure that we equalize the pressure um, to stabilize and prevent uh, the foundation collapsing, which is uh, serious structural damage and um, it can be expensive. So uh, the ductwork should also be uh, one foot above grade. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so this is just another diagram. I think this is from our quick guide. Um, but basically, uh, you can kind of measure from the outside based on like the type of building blocks, if you know the size of them, that it, it can help you measure that and make sure, again, that it's compliant and everything. Um, yep, ductwork uh, should also be one foot above the base flood elevation in Kansas, at least. And then diagram nine, so this is the last diagram, is elevated on a subgrade crawl space. So um, it's kind of like a basement and this is only allowed for preform structures and it has to be written into the ordinance. And we only have a couple of communities that are approved to have this type of construction. It has to have um, openings. Again, it's not allowed on a post firm building. Um, and there's a technical bulletin on this, um, but it does have regulations that have to go into the ordinance or your resolution. Uh, they have to be inspected and uh, we have to verify these crawl spaces are compliant. Um, okay, we only have two communities in Kansas that have this. Um, basically, they changed the regulations after a disaster where people were in a hurry to rebuild and then um, they, they did this instead of um, you know, how it should have been built. So it was you know, one of those situations, but uh, that's something else to look out for is disasters and the hurry to rebuild, but we still have to verify compliance. So I do have classes on post-disaster post procedures and uh, substantial damage stuff. So um, check those out on our training page. Um, but again, otherwise, if you don't have this specifically written into your ordinance, they're not allowed. Um, and they can't be more than two feet below grade. Otherwise, I would make it a basement. So these are not considered a basement by FEMA, even though they're below grade. Again, with all these special conditions and regulations. And so um, I would definitely encourage you to uh, look at the instructions if you have more questions about this. Um, Again, keep an eye out for the new form. Um, and again, with crawl spaces, they can't be more than five feet to the next higher floor. And that's also in the instructions. And so, um, yep, this is a close up of the instructions um, that gives you the specifics on how these are constructed and how they're different from like a diagram two, uh, two A. And that, yeah, <laughs> so take a look at that if you. Um, have any questions about it. Um, again, the instructions are important to help us uh, avoid making any mistakes. And so uh, flood openings, uh, A8 is for flood openings. And so if, if there's engineered openings, make sure that the certificate that comes with these openings is um, there as an attachment for this. Um, and it tells you what they're rated for, uh, the net opening. And so if someone doesn't have enough flood openings, they can use engineered openings that are a little bit more expensive, but it might actually save them money in having to do a major retrofit. So just uh, being aware of that. Um, <clears throat> so an engineered opening has pivots inside. And so again, it floats and it automatically opens with rising flood water and flood openings cannot have any human intervention to uh, work properly. So um, if you have covers on them 
or uh, like the sliding uh, vent thing, it has to be permanently disabled in the open position. And so um, louves, if they, like if the covering covers up 50% of the area, it's not as much opening with the cover. And so that's why we have net opening and not gross. And we have to uh, take into account the covering, uh, reducing the amount of opening. So just making sure you're aware of that. Um, so we do have a um, technical bulletin on flood openings that is uh, technical bulletin one, uh, and it's helpful uh, if you're not sure. And then we do have a non-engineered opening guide that kind of gives you um, basically like the average measurements for the different types of covers. And so that can help you as well. Um, it's online. I could send you a link to it. So for example, this is a problem because clearly the opening is you know, covered. It's completely closed. It's not permanently disabled in the open position. And so for A8, it should actually say no openings, whereas it says 480. Um, so that's something that would have to be corrected. And then A9 for attached garages, um, it's a lot like A8. Um, so there shouldn't be any blank spaces. If there's no garage, it should, it should say NA. Uh, the same thing for section C, which again, we'll talk about on Thursday, but if it if doesn't apply, it should say NA. It shouldn't be left blank because then we're not sure if they missed it or if it's not actually there. Um, attached garages should be structurally connected, and that's what it means by attached. It should have a common wall. Um, otherwise, it would be a separate structure and have to have its own policy or its own elevation certificate if it has utilities. Um, and then speaking of utilities, um, this is another illustration from our quick guide. Uh, machinery and equipment. Um, so you can have openings in the attached garage, uh, but not in the structure. So again, it should have flood openings if it's uh, below the base flood elevation. And then this is, again, is not eligible for the machinery and equipment credit. Um, that's very specific to um, how high they have to be elevated uh, compared to your structure type. And then if you're not sure how to Find surveyors, it's the Kansas Society of Land Surveyors. And then this is a hand, we have a handout for people um, to help them uh, figure out how to hire a surveyor. So if you need a copy of that, let me know. Um, and then we're about out of time here. So we have questions. Not sure if there's anything in the chat. <laughs> I didn't see any questions in the chat um, that I didn't already answer, that is. Okay, great. So if you do think of any questions, um, feel free to reach out. Again, I do plan on following up when the new form is released. And then if you need a certificate for your uh, CFM credit, let me know. I will be sending them out uh, separately per class. So um, I don't make them automatically. So if you need a certificate, please uh, send me an email and I'll be happy to send you one. Well, other than that, um, I don't hear any questions, or if you have questions, uh, feel free to come off mute. All right, then. Well, I do appreciate you guys uh, spending an hour of your day with me. Um, again, we'll be at the same time tomorrow for Section B of the Elevation Certificate. Awesome, thanks.